right? Who is different? Just like, yeah. Yeah, I get that. Just to say that this is more to the point. That's right. That's right. So, so, let's proceed. For the presentation, so, Dan Cox uh, will give uh, his talk, but the title has changed, so please read. Okay. Same talk. <laughs> the talk is the same. <laughs> the talk is the same. Yeah, so, uh, thank you for uh, 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 this wonderful meeting. Uh, I've learned a lot from this meeting. And uh, just to convince you that, maybe I won't convince you by the end of the talk, but just to convince you that I do things besides handle cameras. Um, this is uh, this is my other job. So um, the, the question here, um, it, which is implied by the title there, but I realize this is a, a, a clearer way to say it probably, is can quantum mechanics play a role in DNA damage recognition? And this is really the work that was in the dissertation of my student, uh, John Chen Lin, who went on to a postdoc with Dev Thermali at the University of Maryland, and with my uh, long-term collaborator on biological physics problems, Rajiv Singh. At UC Davis, uh, and we got support uh, from uh, I2CAM, some the Center for Theoretical Biological Physics, uh, the Department of Energy, and some of the earlier work uh, dealing with electronic properties and quantum properties of DNA was uh, funded by the Center for Biophotonics, Science, and Technology at, at Davis. Uh, oh, that's right. Let me just do this. Um, okay, so uh, this is what the object is of interest here. The, pro, the, the protein mu y, which is the name given to it in E. coli, is given a similar name in humans. Basically, this protein exists in every organism, from humans down to E. coli, uh, every, every organism that has a, a genome. And versions of this protein find and heal a particular damage site in DNA. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Uh, what's interesting is that not all aspects of the protein are conserved, and the human version is a little bit bigger than the E. coli version. It recruits a few more proteins to the process than it does the E. coli version. But very conserved from E. coli to us is the region around this iron sulfur complex. And um, if my colleague Rajiv had the chance to meet the discoverer of BY, who's a National Academy member, professor at Duke, and asked him, you know what the iron sulfur complex does? And he says, nope, I don't know. So there's a mystery about this iron sulfur complex, and such iron sulfur complexes and proteins often are, not always, but often are associated with charge transfer. Um, with, this, uh, with this in mind, uh, Jackie Barton uh, uh, at Caltech asked the question, does mu Y find its way to the damage site that repairs electronically? Uh, and uh, Jackie Barton is, a, a, I think, a, a wonderful uh, scientist who's uh, stimulated the community on electronic properties of DNA in a, a gigantic way. Um, these are published items uh, uh, on, uh, D this is from the Web of Science, uh, you search on DNA and elect uh, electric star charge and transfer, you'll see that there, there are hundreds of papers published every year and the citation count has grown to the order of 30,000 a year in the past uh, couple of years. And this was the, the key paper written uh, some 17 years ago by the Barton Group. So there's a, a before Barton and after Barton mark on, on these plots. So uh, this, there's certainly been some controversy, but I think she's a courageous scientist uh, who has uh, helped to stimulate this uh, general community quite a bit. And we're looking at this particular question of hers. Now it turns out we won't look at it in exactly the way that she did. But I think there is a possibility of some role of quantum mechanics in this for this particular protein, and I won't uh, extend it beyond this protein. So this is what mu y does. Basically, uh, G and C and DNA, of course, are known to pair together. Uh, but in conditions where you have uh, oxidative species running around, you can actually modify G by attaching an extra oxygen to it. Uh, what can then happen upon replication is it's, it becomes as possible, not as possible, but it becomes possible for that oxidized guanine to not uh, bind to cytosine, but rather to bind to, to adenosine. Um, and uh, then uh, the problem would be that if you didn't correct this upon further replication, you get a, a, a T over here on the other side, and you would then induce a mutation. Uh, in fact, the mutations associated with this play a significant role in some forms of colon cancer. Uh, so what mu y does is it finds this uh, site where oxidized, or sorry, where oxyguanine binds to adenosine, 
it uh, binds and it sniffs out the adenosine, and then further uh, uh, proteins come along and repair the whole process. But the initial step is mu y finding its way to the oxid-guanine adenosine uh, parasite. Now, why would you consider the possibility? Uh, aren't there other mechanisms that can do just as good a job as electronic searching? Possibly, but I want to just at least set up for you why there might be some questions along these lines. Uh, first of all, as many of you probably know, the standard paradigm for how proteins find binding sites was introduced by Berg, Von Hippel, and Winter around 30 years ago, with modifications added on to that and, and elaborations added on to that. Uh, and the basic idea is this, that if you, if you were to allow proteins to diffuse one-dimensionally along DNA, it would take an impossibly long time to, uh, to find their binding sites. When the DNA supercoils, either in coiled plasmids in bacteria or in chromosomes, chromatin inside of eukaryotes, then what happens is regions, regions of the DNA which are far um, genetically, far along the sequence from where you might be at a particular point, but close spatially because of the supercoiling, suddenly become accessible to three-dimensional excursions. So the idea is that you slide along, this is a picture of sliding here, you slide along um, one-dimensional regions, then you dissociate uh, that non-specifically bound protein to another region that's close by spatially, but perhaps far along the genetic sequence, and then you, you search again. And this can actually take you then from a, 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 a situation where the scaling is with the square root of time, diffusive behavior, to scaling linear in time in a much faster uh, search process. Um, just to give you some numbers that you can do back of the envelope estimates with, if you assume just the one-dimensional diffusion with the typical kind of 1D diffusion constant, you can look up of about uh, 10 to the minus 9 centimeters squared per second. For the E. coli uh, plasmid uh, genome, you would uh, be able to search that in about one year to find your binding site, which is obviously slow because E. coli uh, cell cycle in about uh, an hour. Uh, on the other hand, if you combine the 1D plus 3D searching, you can get that down to 170 seconds with the linear speed up. Uh, and uh, with humans, of course, the chromosomes are about 20 times longer than these plasmids. That would take 500 years when you take account of the square root of t uh, time for diffusive searching, and you get that down to about an hour if you do 1D plus 3D. Now, of course, you usually make multiple copies. I was trying in vain to find a number for the copies of the Y that you would find on a typical chromosome or, or plasmid. I don't know. They're reputed to be quite small. Uh, if you obviously uh, 3,400 seconds is still pretty slow uh, if you're trying to, to find and replace these mutation errors on, on a human chromosome. So uh, the the idea here is to suggest that at least even if you do parallel processing, you know, given that this is about a, uh, a 20th of the of the cell cycle time for E. coli, even if you do parallel processing with say copies of 10 proteins or so, these still look a little bit slow. So it's worth considering other mechanisms. Um, Okay, so there's that. Uh, there's also another aspect which is really where we believe there's a chance for quantum mechanics to play a role in being why. That is that even in the Bird von Hippel theory, you do the non-specific sliding in one dimension, but if you slide too fast, you're not going to bind. You're going to go right by the binding site. So there needs to be some slowing down in the region of the binding site. And one possibility is sort of an induced fit mechanism, and Murney and co-workers at MIT have done some interesting recent work about uh, this idea, but it could also be facilitated if there was some redox triggered recognition, and this is where we think mu y may um, have a, there might be a quantum role to the mu-dox, uh, sorry, to the redox recognition at the, at the relevant damage site of mu y. Um, okay, so this is just, again, saying that there might be room for alternative mechanisms. Okay, so the second question is, is there any possibility of quantum role uh, in, uh, in the case of DNA, and yes, the, the, the answer is, of course, we've already heard uh, photolyase mentioned here in Torsten Ritz's lecture. Uh, photolyase is a protein which heals particular uh, damage, the TT dimer damage that can be introduced by ultraviolet light, where thymines, neighboring thymines actually uh, uh, covalently bond under uh, ultraviolet light. The photolyase finds this damage site and with photoactivated electron transfer will heal that damage site. This is not an um, operation that uh, works for us as humans, but it is an operation that works in some plants, for example. Um, we also know that oxidative damage of DNA can lead to an oxidized uh, GG damage site. 
uh, and that there's basically quantum transfer of holes um, along the, the, the DNA chain. They settle in at these uh, GG pairs, and uh, those are then hot spots for mutations. They, they aren't damaged per se themselves, but they can attract species which can then damage the DNA there. Uh, and uh, that can happen by direct electron transfer tunneling, that is, coherent quantum mechanical tunneling at distances uh, less than tw 2 nanometers or 20 angstroms. It's electron hopping, uh, incoherent electron hopping past that point. Um, the Barton group has shown that uh, through uh, electron hopping events, or successive electron hopping events, that uh, the attachment of photoactivated charged donors to DNA can induce or repair or prepare damage at a distance hundreds of base pairs away. Now, only the, the first steps of that would be coherent uh, quantum mechanical uh, transfer, and, and subsequent steps would be incoherent uh, hopping. Um, and what they've also shown is that uh, this long-range uh, healing or, um, uh, or damage is, is disrupted if you deliberately put in defects that can contract the charges. Um, and there's been numerous experiments by the Barton Group that illustrate both of these uh, principles. Um, so what's the basic idea uh, of the Barton Group, and what's the strongest piece of evidence in favor of that idea? Well, first of all, the idea that she put forward a number of years ago now was that there could be pairs of mu y that um, um, move along to, to search for electron damage. Uh, the idea is that mu y, normally in, in solution, mu y likes to be uh, uh, divalent, uh, but in, in proximity to DNA, and this was something that her group actually demonstrated, it can become uh, trivalent. It can donate an electron uh, to the DNA. And of course, the trivalent mu y will bind a little more strongly than the divalent mu y, just non specifically because of the negative charge along the DNA backbone. Um, okay, so here's the picture. You've already got a mu y bound here. You have another mu y in the vicinity that non specifically binds, donates an electron. If there's nothing in the way, that electron happily hums down the DNA, gets picked up by this mu y, that pops off. But if there's a damaged site, the electron stops there, and then this mu y keeps moving along until it can bind to the damage site. It's kind of a, a, an intriguing uh, uh, receiver transmitter picture of, of the, the, uh, the searching for the DNA. We're not going to necessarily support this picture, but we're going to support uh, an aspect of it, which is that when you have 3 plus mu y in the vicinity of the, of the oxoguani, it can possibly selectively find and bind to that oxoguani. Um, the interesting experimental evidence that uh, uh, Barton provided here, Barton's group provided, is that um, if you uh, if you uh, you can actually get three plus mu y to bind to DNA, uh, and you can get a current in solution between the mu y and an end electrode. But if you deliberately uh, damage the DNA in between, you'll block that current. The other point is that the efficacy of this process is completely damaged if you do a mutation that alters the uh, the binding of the iron sulfur complex to the, to the DNA, which suggests that the active player here is the iron sulfur complex. And indeed, if you look around the, the mu y, there's really nothing else that could, could be a good charge reservoir on the, on the mu y. So it does seem that this iron sulfur complex certainly plays some role in the redox uh, binding uh, affinity of the mu y to the DNA. So our rather simpler question is, is there any potential selectivity of mu y recognition of oxyguanine that might be useful in, in redox-associated specific binding. So basically, in slowing down the oxoguanine in the vicinity of the, uh, of the uh, uh, sorry, slowing down the mu y in the vicinity of the oxoguanine to allow it to specifically bind. And so the picture is that you get electron transfer to an oxidized G or oxoguanine when mu, mu y is in the vicinity of one of those. You have a fast non-specific slide as a two plus and a slower glide to binding then as, as a three plus. Uh, and the validation of this is, is in comparing the wild type behavior uh, both to uh, oxidized guanine uh, and then also to two mutants that are known to mitigate the uh, repair efficacy of mu y dramatically. Okay, in order to do this, uh, we use um, uh, Marcus Hush theory, uh, which probably needs not much introduction to this audience, but. Roughly the idea is that the donor surface will be where we have an oxidized oxoguanine or guanine and uh, divalent mu y. The acceptor surface would be where we have 3 plus mu y and a neutral oxoguanine. Uh, the intersection of these uh, Born-Oppenheimer surfaces 
of course, uh, would then be an avoided crossing where the splitting would be the tunneling matrix element for the electron. And according to Marcus Hush theory, the, uh, the transfer rate would go like the square of that electron tunneling matrix element, and then this Gaussian factor involving the free energy difference between the two and the reorganization energy. There should be a square here which got funked up on the conversion in PDF. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so this is just the standard uh, Marcus Hush theory, and uh, there are several ingredients in order to uh, make calculations that, that can bear upon this. First of all, using a combination of quantum mechanics and molecular mechanics, we can get at the, the free energy differences and the reorganization energies. Uh, on the other hand, um, the quantum mechanics we're using does not really enable us to compute this, so we've looked at this aspect with uh, the uh, pathways algorithm initiated by Onishik and Baratan, and uh, the Harlem implementation of that that you can, that you can find as freeware. Okay, uh, so uh, the theory strategy then for going after the reorganization energy and the, uh, the free energy difference, uh, for the active regions of MiY, which would be the iron-sulfur complex, and the DNA, which would be guanine or oxoguanine plus surrounding bases, uh, we use uh, the siesta-based uh, density functional theory uh, local orbital based density functional theory to compute energy changes. For the passive regions, we use the amber uh, 9 molecular dynamics to compute energy changes using free energy perturbation analysis, and I'll just um, show you that. But there's a linear interpolation variable that goes, uh, uh, the only thing that's really changing here is the mu y 2 plus and oxoguanine plus going to mu y 3 plus and oxoguanine. So we have a linear interpolation variable that changes the relevant potentials there. Uh, allowing the free energy perturbation theory. And uh, we add these contributions to get the free energies of rearrangement and free energy differences. Schematically, an energy difference will be equal to the, um, the total molecular dynamics energy minus that of the uh, active regions, and then we add back in the quantum mechanical calculation of the active regions. Uh, and so the free energy perturbation, uh, we just have this linear variable phi um, that uh, connects the Hamiltonian of the two different uh, donor and acceptor surfaces, uh, and we get the free energy difference by integrating the derivative of this Hamiltonian with respect to phi uh, along the trajectories, uh, along the, the zero to one path of, of phi, uh, where the average is over um, the, the time ensemble from molecular dynamics. The reorganization energy can be written approximately as a difference between these derivatives at the endpoint, and then the combination of free energy differences to give us delta G is, is written uh, this way. Uh, and now about the estimation of um, HDA, so uh, that's using the, the Harlem program, and basically Harlem does a search for the optimal um, tunneling matrix element over all paths with an approximation uh, that you have an energy prefactor, you can determine approximately from the, the, the local chemistry coupling the donors and acceptors to the bridges, uh, and you have multiplicative factors uh, uh, for going through um, covalent bonds along uh, protein or DNA backbones, going through hydrogen bonds, uh, and going through the, the solvent. Um, in principle, you should actually course, course coherently sum over all of these pathways, and we're only going to find optimal pathways, and that's a potential criticism of what we're going to present, uh, what I'm presenting here. Um, and R is the bond separation uh, for hydrogen bonds or solvent uh, uh, positions in angstroms. The covalent bonds are just taken as single multiplicative factors. Okay, um, so here's a, starting to get some, some results. And one thing is that there's a, there's a preference of electron transfer from UY to oxidized oxoguanine um, over uh, uh, guanine, and that enhances the binding of UY in the vicinity of the oxoguanine. So let's see, this is uh, basically RMSD um, for the atomic coordinates of, of the backbone in the UY complex as a function of time. If you then look at these fluctuations in the, in the coordinates, they translate into fluctuations of the estimated electron transfer rate uh, that look like this. Um, the, uh, the kind of characteristic value for this electron transfer rate is in the, is the ballpark of inverse micro, a few inverse microseconds, uh, to, to give you an idea. Um, let's see. And the most probable rate that we found uh, from this combined QD plus QM is about uh, two inverse microseconds. Now, uh, there is a mutation where you substitute uh, arginine 149 of the protein for tryptophan, and that kills the efficacy of the mu-y behavior. 
Why is that interesting? Well, if you if you look at where the um, look at the crystal structure for co-binding um, of DNA and UY, the arginine happens to sit um, right at the interface of the DNA and, and the uh, the BY. So here we actually show the oxoguanine out of this this sea of uh, molecular uh, structure. We show the oxoguanine over here. We show uh, the iron sulfur complex of the BY over here. And it turns out that the most favorable pathway that we could find from the, the uh, Harlem program runs right through that arginine to the DNA. Uh, and then if you estimate, just on the basis of the, the pathway program, uh, Harlem, estimate the, uh, the ratio of the mutant form to the wild type form, you find that the, the rate of transfer is diminished by a factor, almost an order of magnitude. Now there's a caveat. You could have a purely classical explanation for this. Um, when you actually bind to the oxoguanine region uh, of the DNA, um, that arginine has a nice hydrogen bond to the backbone of the DNA. So uh, when you replace that with tryptophan, you're going to kill that hydrogen bonding, and that may actually be a piece of the slowdown for the mu Y. So this doesn't prove that it, that, it, that it works, but it's certainly intriguing that you get this reduction of the rates. Uh, and this, this, is a this is showing you the, uh, the uh, original wild type form, and this is showing you the mutant form and the modification of the, uh, the pathway. Basically, the biggest issue is taking away that hydrogen bond also uh, reduces the, the, uh, the tunneling strength. Uh, this is a more subtle mutation. L154F is, is not binding to the iron sulfur complex, but it's in the vicinity of the iron sulfur complex. And so you're taking um, leucine, which is uh, intermediate size side chain, and replacing it with a larger uh, phenylalanine side chain. Apparently what this does is, uh, from the molecular dynamic simulations, is that the extra size of the phenylalanine expands the mu y and increases the mean donor acceptor distance. Um, in the optimal rates you get a factor of two decrease in the optimal rates. So um, this is now plotting the uh, estimated electron transfer rates on a logarithmic scale, a histogram of the electron transfer rates. They're, you wouldn't say they're Gaussian, but they're, they're certainly showing a, a peaked behavior. And the wild type mu y is up here in peak, and the uh, log base 10 uh, mu y uh, mutant form is down here. So the peak is about uh, uh, 10 to the minus sixth for the uh, down here, and the peak here is about uh, uh, two times 10 to the minus sixth. So there's at least a decrease in the optimal rate of transfer. Uh, and that's primarily driven by the uh, that's primarily driven by the distance increase. Uh, in addition to exploring those those rate estimates, we also took a look at um, what the, the the free energy surface plots look like. So the first thing is that if you look at the wild type, at least within our estimates, within our calculations, the uh, in terms of not, not now the electronic matrix element, but in terms of the, um, the Frank Condon factor, one discovers that, the, that there's almost a variless reaction within our calculations. Now that's obviously going to be sensitive to the, the calculation scheme, but that's, that's what we found. Um, if you look at mu y going to guani, um, you discover that there is a increased barrier, and at the same time it also puts you into the inverted regime. So the sensitivity to the mu y binding, the mu y transfer of the electron uh, uh, to the oxoguani to form uh, ox, uh, mu y3 plus in the vicinity of the oxoguani is certainly uh, higher, just on the basis of the Frank Condon factor, higher within our um, uh, calculations for the oxoguani. And uh, by the way, oxoguani is going to, because it has a uh, um, smaller oxidation energy, oxoguani is going to be the favorite site for a hole if you have a hole um, created by um, oxidation of DNA. And then if you look at the energy surface for the L154 mutant, then you also find uh, an increased barrier for the um, Frank Condon factor, uh, not in the inverted regime, uh, but within the error bars, one has to say that the, the proof of this is, is far from conclusive within the error bars. But so both in terms of the electronic matrix element and the distance effect here, and the Frank Condon uh, factor, it looks as if though, uh, uh, the mutant form is going to be um, it's going to be less likely to make a transition to the mutant form with a mutant form of my 
than with the uh, wild type form of mu1. Okay, um, let's see. Well, I actually talk fast, I guess. Um, so, in conclusion, in the vicinity of mu y, uh, sorry, in the vicinity of oxidized oxyguanine, not neutral oxyguanine, it must be said, but the presence of oxidized oxyguanine, there seems to be a preferential binding of mu y uh, in the presence of oxidized oxyguanine, meaning preferential to oxidized guanine. Uh, that this enhanced binding allows a, a faster finding of the damage site in a slow recognition mode. Uh, given that charge transfer in DNA can be coherent at distances of 2 nanometers, the mu y doesn't actually have to be right on top of the oxyguanine in order for this recognition to take place. Most of the time spent in the microsec microsecond scale transfer rate is, is in getting from the mu y to the DNA, getting from the iron sulfur complex to the DNA. Once you get the charge in the DNA, that transfer happens on the scale of uh, picoseconds, at least if it's within two nanometers of the, uh, of the transfer site. Now, this doesn't answer the transmitter-receiver question posed by Barton, but it does suggest that um, electron transfer can play a role uh, in the recognition of the damage site. And that's, that's our story, and we're sticking to it, kind of. <laughs> Thank you. Questions? Okay. Well, we're gonna have a speed up, a speed up of recognition of Jeff's talk. Then. Yeah. <laughs> hey, thank you once more. And now we will proceed to the last presentation given by Jeff Reynolds. Product condensation and quantum consistency.
Uh, two have been observed. Froelich condensate has not been observed. Uh, there's a thousand papers on Froelich condensation, all of which suggest that maybe they found it, but actually precisely none of them have found it. Uh, and it's a biological condensate. This is the biological macroscopic quantum effect and analogous to superconductivity and Bose-Einstein condensation. Quantum consciousness. Well, uh, that's a theory which says that uh, consciousness or cognitive thinking as we know it is a quantum effect. Cannot be described by classical interactions, cannot be described by electrochemical neural networks. That theory has profound consequences if you're trying to build a, uh, an artificial intelligence system using silicon computers. In fact, it, it says you can't do it. Um, and Google uh, yesterday had uh, an all-day symposium on the topic in which uh, quantum consciousness was a key uh, player. So you can, you can look that up on the web tonight, I believe. Uh, anyway, the, the work that I've done here is uh, myself, Laura McKennish, did the work with my uh, student, Ross McKenzie, a physicist from the University of Queensland. He uh, did all coherence and quantum computing aspects of the work. But Alan Mark, a uh, famous uh, biophysical simulator, you know, he's held the record for the largest ever simulations of a biological system at different times of his life, and getting into the microsecond regime, that's the sort of thing he does. Uh, so this is the, uh, and Professor Hush at Sydney University, well it was his idea. And so this is the team we put together to try and look at these sort of phenomena. And I'd like to thank uh, ICAM uh, for getting it all going, and the Australian Research Council for putting up the money. Uh, ICAM, what's ICAM got to do with it? Well, there was a conference uh, in Yapoon in 2007, physicists, chemists, biologists, and Dan Cox, our previous lecturer, asked the question, now what is the fundamental challenge facing basic science in the 21st century? What is the most important issue that needs to be looked at in fundamental science? And Professor Hush said the origin of intelligence. Um, so this is how it all started, blame Dan. <laughs> uh, Jeff said, but what could we do? <laughs> Um, to which Prof. Hash said the, the Penrose Hameroff model of quantum consciousness by orchestrated objective reduction. <laughs> That's uh, uh, Penrose, as in uh, Penrose and Hawking. Uh, he's a, quite a famous mathematician, um, done a lot, a lot on quantum gravity and, and other basic uh, fields. Uh, what is orchestrated objective reduction, uh, known to its mates as Ork LR? So it starts with a theorem by Penrose. Penrose's theorem says that computational systems like neural networks and modern computers are fundamentally incapable of cognitive function. So this talk, uh, unlike the rest of the conference, please interject at any moment. Right, go. So what's the evidence that we're capable of cognitive function? <laughs> 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 There is, a, there is a nastier question, which is define what consciousness is, so at least I didn't get that one. Uh, um, and indeed, they're both very good questions. So this is why it's a fundamental thing for science in the 21st century. There are no clear answers to that question, or the question is, what is consciousness? How does Penrose's theorem work? Well, there's um, Turing's theorem says that a computer cannot determine if it's going to finish or not. And uh, a related beast called Goodell's theorem. And Goodell's theorem is supposed to be the most important result in mathematics of the 20th century. And Goodell's theorem says that results are true which cannot be based upon the 11 axioms of mathematics. Uh, which fundamentally shook uh, the whole mathematics community and in fact, the logic community and the philosophy community are, are all deeply embedded in this. Uh, so Penrose's theorem is a lemma based upon Goodell's theorem. Uh, if we know that things are true that can't be proved by mathematics, then we must be beyond mathematics. There must be something in us 
but isn't described by the 11 axioms in mathematics. That's, that's how the theorem goes. Now, uh, I'm not going to defend or criticize the theorem. There is a big literature that tries to do both. Uh, and in fact, everything that we've done makes zero impact upon Penrose's original theorem. Uh, very, very profound. Though. Any, any, other, any other questions at, at this point? Just, just interject. Make this dynamic. Uh, right here. Penrose and Hameroff uh, then produced a biochemical model to explain how consciousness works, something beyond a, a, a neural network, that it involves neural networks but goes beyond it to add explicitly quantum effects. Uh, you've got a quantum computer being set up in this operation and the qubits of the quantum computer are microtubules. Every cell in every organism contains microtubules. They provide the structural support for every cell. So they're supposed to form the qubits. You need entanglement. Uh, entanglement comes from London forces in some not really well specified way in their theory. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I get to the end of the talk, I'll, I'll actually tell you what. I'll give you numerical numbers for the sorts of things that they uh, reckon does everything in their theory. Uh, if we get to the end, I have not get to the end of this because the interjections. So keep them coming. <laughs> um, so hydrophobic pockets are caused by London forces. London forces intrinsically involve entanglement of electrons. You, you can't separate a London force from an entangled electron. Therefore, uh, they form the basis for, for a quantum computer. This, this, is, this is their logic. Uh, entangled states uh, have to be maintained coherently. Uh, that's where the frolic condensation condensate comes in until the superposition of states is destroyed uh, not as we've seen throughout this uh, conference by leaking uh, down in vibrational coupling but via quantum gravity yeah. right, anyone? Uh, that's, that's objective reduction, is quantum gravity uh, right. no questions? why quantum gravity? why not something Else? Why quantum gravity and not something else? Quantum gravity, according to Penrose, I don't understand this, and lots of people have said he's wrong on this point in the literature, but they don't understand it either. So, um, but I'll just present what Penrose says, and that quantum gravity, if uh, any form of coherence or decoherence that we're used to decoheres the system, then it produces quite a different result to if quantum gravity uh, causes the decoherence. It's objective if quantum uh, gravity does it, and it's not objective, it's computational if anything that we're used to does it. That's what Penrose says. He doesn't prove that anywhere I've ever seen. Uh, most people ignore it. Uh, how does quantum gravity work? I'll, I'll tell you how quantum gravity works a bit later. If, that's it. <laughs> if no one is interested, I'll ignore it. Have you tried to think of implications in the authorship of this paper that might suggest they were joking? No, <laughs> absolutely not. Absolutely not. Uh, there are two uh, responses to, to this work. Uh, those coming from a, um, an, uh, a what is intelligence sort of background. And they think this is the most wonderful thing ever seen because it can explain in qualitative nature, there's nothing quantitative, a whole range of experimental observations on consciousness that no one can dream some other explanation of. So there's this crowd that absolutely love it. And then there's a crowd of sort of physicists and chemists who dismiss it without really considering what it is because it just sounds absurd. Uh, I think there's another community which actually tries to make Tests of this to refute them that way in quantum optics, in fact. Uh, so, which is, I think, the best place to go about. Right, yeah. Uh, uh, certainly, things to do with quantum computers I'm very well aware of. Um, and I don't know if that's what you're meaning in quantum optics. Right, it's a bit simpler than that. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, microscopic objects that you would like to put into a position. Oh, yes, yes, sir. Uh, 
if there is such an effect of this type, then we should look for a limited time and maybe we should come to that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah. Is it actually an experiment, experimental proof of quantum gravity? No. Back, yeah, right, yeah, thank you. That's what I was going to say, but it's not my field. <laughs> the answer was no. It's pretty good to have a hypothesis that can prove or disprove it because. Yeah. Now, remember, this is Penrose's strength. Uh, the, the Penrose and Hawking papers uh, have dominated a lot of high energy physics, and you know, this uh, big thing built at CERN opened last year. Uh, has a lot to do with Penrose and Hameroff, so uh, these are big people who know what they're talking about in this area, although I don't understand any of it. Well, uh -huh. okay. Yep. Um, to my knowledge, tubules, I mean, microtubules are not the only polymers uh, that are held together by hydrophobic reactions between the proteins. So, um, <laughs> so what, uh, people with Alzheimer's disease would be really smart then? <laughs> uh, well, yes, experiments like that are the, are the sort of questions they try and answer with this penrose hameroff theory, you know, Alzheimer's disease and, and the, the difficulty in understanding it. Uh, whether there's another explanation that uh, would be more intuitive to physicists and chemists is, is, uh, is of course, another question. Uh, there are two parts to, to my talk here when I get on with it. The first part is the biochemical model. And then the second part is could, that's the microtubules, and the second part is could some other biochemical model achieve the same effects? So I'm uh, addressing the question that you, that you raised there. Uh, so I aim, so, well, is the biochemical model on microtubules, is it feasible? That was question number one. Question number two, frolic condensates are critical. Um, what's known about frolic condensates? Could they really establish macroscopic quantum coherence as is required in the system? Then other questions like what is the entanglement in hydrophobic pockets? So I actually calculated that at MP2 level, CASP2 level. And uh, the coherence uh, of electronic motions induced by London forces, I look at that right at the end of the talk using time-dependent CISD calculations. Um, so there's some heavy stuff at the end if we get there. Uh, the last thing to do, if all those four worked, then what we we're trying to do is a full atom level description of the tubular dimer. We'd run semi-classical molecular dynamics, run Hellas, and Gaussians to look at coherence times and see if we could reproduce all of the properties that they were describing and try to get as long a time scale as possible that we could get to with the coherence, which is supposed to be microseconds. So, but anyway, we've done one before, but not five. So the biological model, this is how the qubit works. So this is a microtubule. Uh, they're long rods, microns long, uh, 13 tubulin dimers in diameter. Here's a tubulin dimer. And tubulin dimers can have two conformations. Uh, the alpha conforma, shown here in black, and the beta conforma, shown here, shown here in white. And the electrons are in different spots, as you see here. So this is an electron transfer system with uh, two geometries being involved. And Penrose and Hammeroff down here have the resonant. Resonance creates a superposition of two conformants. And that's the quantum mechanical effect that they're dealing with. Uh, very similar to things that people have been talking about the whole length of this conference. Uh, I guess I don't need to tell this audience. Examples of resonance benzene, which is delocalized. Uh, ammonia, which is localized. Uh, you know, all electron transport and biology and chemistry and photosynthesis is in this meaning. Now, this model, this uh, two vibration, uh, two electronic states uh, couple. The uh, how to make a quantum computer out of that. There's the full solution was done by Ross McKenzie, published in this paper here in 2004. That's why you know, sort of Ross is on the team. Plus, Ross was there right from the beginning. Uh, 
So you can make quantum computers out of this sort of technology. Uh, that goes back to what you were saying at, at, uh, there about the quantum optics. Uh, we are touching upon real achievable things in the lab in some way here. So uh, that is what they do compared to something that we do. Uh, this back here, the standard Marcus Hush theory again, these are two uh, geometries. Uh, there's a coupling, 2J I'm using here instead of HDA for the coupling, and the reorganization energy. Oops, Lambda, reorganization energy is here up. Sorry, that's a mistake. Oh dear. Uh, and uh, we'll look at the, this is the McKenzie paper from 2004. This is the whole parameter space of the model. Here we've plot uh, 2J on lambda, uh, that's the main control parameter in Marcus Hush theory. So here you've got localized, uh, localized states like ammonia, and here delocalized states like benzene. And up here is the vibration frequency over the electronic energy gap, so that's the breakdown of the Born-Offenheimer approximation. So Marcus Hush theory here, Born-Offenheimer theory here. So up here you've got a pseudo yarn teller effect where the splitting between the states is small compared to the vibrational space. So everywhere on that diagram we can calculate the entanglement. Now this is a von Neumann entropy which is different to, slightly different to the entanglement uh, that Francesca described this morning. The idea is the same. One is the um, uh, einstein podolsky rosen paradox and zero is classical mechanics. So where do you sit? Uh, here the entanglement is near one and that's things like this. Uh, ammonia, and the entanglement goes to zero if uh, you've got benzene or uh, a young teller case. Now this one here, um, we introduce an asymmetry. This is uh, an electronic energy gap which is one hundredth of the vibrational spacing and it's all gone. Uh, so this entanglement is extremely uh, 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 sensitive to fluctuations which will destroy the symmetry, just like in the einstein podolsky rosen paradox. Uh, here's some data points, there's ammonia. Uh, never dreamt that ammonia was there, most people would have put uh, ammonia sort of deep down in here, but it's sitting right there. Uh, benzene, just next to it. <laughs> Didn't expect ammonia and benzene to be almost on top of each other on this plot. But, uh, for, for chemists, that's the gross alveolar. And down here is bacterial photosynthesis. Uh, way down here, there's almost no entanglement in, uh, in the special pair radical cation of bacterial photosynthesis because the energy offset has destroyed the entanglement. Uh, where's that data point come from? That's come from Prof. Hush and my model for the special pair radical cation. Uh, that was four electronic states, 50 anti-symmetric modes, 20 symmetric modes. We did the full quantum solution of the dynamics of this system. Calculated all the parameters using density functional theory that went into the model, except we optimized seven critical parameters by at most 20% to fit the experimental data. And this is the experimental data we fitted. That's the observed absorption spectrum from Breton. Uh, and down here, these are vibrational transitions. We have high resolution information in the experiment. So each electron photon line that's uh, dephasing it is observed in the experiment. And uh, so from our model, we predicted a correlation between the spin density measured from, from ESR and the electrochemical potentials for 30 mutants of the reaction center with perfect agreement to all that data. Plus, we predicted the Stark spectrum here of not only the wild type, but also of a range of mutants. And the Stark spectra are just bizarre, they have nothing, the mutants look nothing like that. And Boxer then subsequently measured the Stark spectra and got quantitative agreement to our predictions. So, uh, our model here of the special theoretical cation, I think, is, can explain every experimental data and make serious predictions. So, I think it's a, it's a good data point. But this is what I do normally, not, not what I'm talking about in the talk. <laughs> Back to Penrose and Hameroff. Uh, here's their microtubule. This is an extract from one of their papers. Uh, black is one of their confinements, and white is another of their confinements. So, if we're looking, this is one cycle of a neural network, which is a millisecond cycle for the firing of a neural network. Here's the start of it. And each of these structures are in a, a classical state. 
and then in here there's the grey. So entanglement starts to develop between the qubits in different microtubule diam uh, in different tubulin diamonds. And uh, the interaction is so strong that the entanglement starts to grow over a range. Here it is spreading out over the microtubule. And down here, it's spread over the entire microtubule, which is microns in length. And they don't say that in this paper, but in other papers, they have it spreading between neurons, crossing the cell wall between neurons as well, too. So they go to the. Uh, and then the mass gets too large. And, you, and quantum gravity comes in, collapses the wave function down to a classical state here, and that's the cycle. Uh, so according to them, that's how intelligence operates. Uh, is, uh, is the start of the cycle here where there's no coherence. The coherence builds up, the superposition of states ranges over the entire microtubule and beyond. Quantum gravity collapses you down into a classical state. The classical state interferes with the electrochemical potential of the cell and, and therefore takes the quantum computation and tells its result to the classical computation in the neurons. So that's their model. <coughs> Questions? <laughs> yep. Uh, so I guess uh, what you were saying about the difference between um, quantum gravitational collapse and everything else explains why the kinesium walking around these on these microtubules that can only bind to a specific site of the dimer does not decohere the, uh, the entanglement between the dimer states because it's observing which dimer it has to step, which part of the dimer it has to step on. Oh, you know a lot about microtubule dynamics. Uh, um, I, had to, I had to teach about kinesis in the class. Yeah. Um, Hameroff integrates all that stuff into his model. Um, we, we've had email exchanges over many months and we had a long discussion on that point and he kept referring me back to one of his papers on it and I sent him back a complete analysis of his paper which basically said it was a load of nonsense. Um, uh, and no, uh, as far as I can tell in the, in the literature, no person in the biochemistry field has ever referred to Hameroff's papers where he explains all that data using his model. Uh, talk more about it later, and we'll get into the specifics. Uh, yep? Why is the time scale so slow? Uh, this is 500 milliseconds. This is the neural time scale here. The firing of a neuron. So why is it so slow? Yes, 3 milliseconds is probably a better value. Uh, I don't know why they said 500 milliseconds there. Uh, in, in later of their papers, they said that the quantum coherence only needs to survive for a microsecond and the effect will still work. But they can't really make it work for less than a microsecond. Which is still six orders of magnitude faster than they say in the original papers. Yeah. Uh huh. Is there any explicit mentioning what they actually mean by quantum gravitational collapse? Uh, yeah, well, they give an equation. <laughs> right. Now, this is my interpretation. Their equation is, is a perturbation series, it seems to me. I've never seen a proof of the equation. And you work out the terms and they get, they're a hundred times smaller each successive term. So I'll, I'll tell you Jeff's interpretation of the first term. Right. Now, imagine you've got ammonia. So here's ammonia in one configuration. So here's ammonia in its alternate structure. Now, let's put them together like that. So there's two molecules, one of the ammonia structure in each configuration. Calculate the gravitational potential energy between those two structures. So H bar divided by the gravitational potential energy gives it an uncertainty. So this is a Heisenberg uncertainty principle is the extent to which quantum mechanics is evoked in their analysis, I think. Well, that's my interpretation. My interpretation. Why, why gravity and not one of us forces? Um, the Van der Waals forces are, are a vote to create the entanglement, and the gravity is a vote to destroy the entanglement. It has to be something that doesn't work the usual way. That means it has to be something for which yeah. you don't have any theory yet. Yeah. <laughs> so Does it at least show that the strong forces are actually weaker effect than the gravitational they are using? 
Uh, but the mass has to get very large. That's why the superposition of states has to range over the whole length of the microtubule or beyond to get the mass large. And as the mass gets larger, the time gets smaller. And so and they started off here with 500 milliseconds in one microtubule, and then they ended up with it spreading over neurons and a, mic and a, and a microsecond later. Uh, but I guess we try to take it seriously and, and see if it worked. Uh, I, re I, really, I really tried hard to make it work, I promise. <laughs> Hammer off wouldn't believe it. Uh, so to start, reality. What happens to the life cycle of a microtubule? And this, this is it down here, and I'll take it out in slow bits. Uh, tubule and dimers, free and so the, uh, there's, there's two structures. One has GDP bound in a binding site and the other GDP. So that's the, the cause of the two conformers, whether GDP or GTP is bound. In solution you have a G, uh, TP bound. And uh, then a microtubule has a growing end. Uh, if, you, if you've got a cell here and you push it forward, then the microtubules all line up in the direction of the push and at the end you're pushing it to, the microtubules grow and they decompose at the end you're pushing it from. So this treadmilling is how a cell moves forward if you push it. And so I'm describing here the treadmilling of microtubules holding cells together. So the tubule and dimers attach to the growing end here. And then shortly thereafter they lose the phosphate down here a couple of uh, layers down and they become uh, the GDP form. But the GDP form has a different structure. The, the uh, GDP likes to form these cylinders but the GDP is bent and doesn't want to form in cylinders. So it's trapped in an unstable state. And after a while they get down to the bottom and they fall off. Uh, so here's uh, microtubule growth and decay, that's you push it forward. Uh, but now let's suppose you stop pushing the cell that way and you push the cell this way, the microtubules are in the wrong direction. So what happens is an enzyme chops the top off. And when the top's chopped off, it decomposes in both directions in milliseconds. And then a pressure sensitive enzyme uh, templates the growth of a microtubule in the direction of, of the push. And then the microtubules regrow completely, microns long and wrap around each other, all in the other direction. And that's, that's how a cell moves. Uh, the bottom bit is you end up with GDP dimers in solution at the end of all of this. And they're rephosphorylated in solution, and, and that's your cycle. So Penrose and Hameroff said you've had both conformers in a microtubule at the same time and swap irreversibly between the two conformational forms. It's a load of nonsense. It's an irreversible chemical reaction. You've got to destroy the entire microtubule to cycle uh, the tubule and dimer. So that's the end of their biochemical me mechanism. It doesn't exist. You don't know how upset I was when this was discovered. Of course, oh, shut up, Jeff. Right, step two. Could some other biochemical mechanism produce a quantum computer like they evoke the microtubules? And that's where they need frolic condensation, because you can't have coherence on a microsecond or millisecond time scale without something dramatically different, which is what a frolic condensate is. Uh, so what's a frolic condensate? Uh, this is frolic's theory. Uh, You've got a collection of oscillators here. Uh, these are the dumbbells. I've got three oscillators here, but the Z in the mathematical theory, Z number of oscillators. And they fed power from a source. This is a non-equilibrium steady state theory with energy flowing from a hot body through your system to a cold body. So the energy is coming from a source with a power S fed to each oscillator. And then the energy flows into the kind of low temperature bath at a rate phi here. And critical to the whole thing, a non-linear coupling between all the oscillators. Don't work without that. So, uh, um, 
than what Frolic did. Uh, he used quantum statistical mechanics. No Hamiltonian was required. Frolic derived an asymptotic result for this system, which is the Frolic condensate. It's all based upon having equilibrium when the driving power S is zero. So it's an extremely powerful result, Hamiltonian independent. And this is the result. Uh, NT here is the number of quant vibrational quanta in the oscillators at room temperature. So that's, this is your thermal number of quanta at thermal equilibrium. N here is the number of quanta that you actually have in the system at steady state. So this number grows. N minus NT could be a million here. You've got a huge increase in the number of quanta in the system. It's proportional to the number of oscillators. It's proportional to the ratio of the input to output powers. And it's proportional to the ratio of the temperature to the frequency. So this is explicitly a high temperature effect. Explicitly high temperature. It gets bigger at higher temperature. Completely opposite to other macroscopic quantum effects. And Froehlich called it a Bose-Einstein-like condensate. And why is that? Not only do the number of quanta grow alarmingly large, all the quanta go into the mode of lowest frequency. Now, the, the, the Z oscillators in the bath, oscillator number one with the lowest frequency gets all the quanta, Z minus one don't get any. So he called it a Bose-Einstein-like condensate, although Froelich himself dropped the word like many times later on. And most authors who refer to it drop the word like as well. Uh, but uh, what we did, we simulated the entire parameter space of the Froelich model. That had never been done before. We did this numerically. And this is a summary of the results here. Uh, there are four parameters. So uh, we've got here as a a plot of uh, two of the parameters, the ratio of the input to output power, and this is the nonlinearity here. And that's just this plot here, and there's two other parameters. This is the frequency over the temperature. And this is uh, the, the difference between the first vibrational level and the second vibrational level. And uh, we introduced uh, a condensation index, uh, which is plotted up here. It's black or zero if there's no condensate, and it's one if you've got a frolic condensate. So down here, all these white pinky regions, that's your Froelich condensate, exactly as Froelich described in his mathematics. Everything Froelich said is perfect. But uh, we have done a lot more things to that. Uh, for example, down here, there is this purple hatched region. And this is a non-equilibrium effect with energy flowing from a source through the system to a bath. So the system has to be hotter than the bath. The bath is room temperature the system has to be hotter. This purple hatched region is 500 Kelvin for a 300 Kelvin bath. Now, why 500 Kelvin? People say that that's not biologically feasible. And where do we get 500 Kelvin from? Well, because it's absolutely absurdly high value is why we chose 500 Kelvin. No one could say that we haven't chosen a high enough value. <laughs> and nowhere on the parameter space is there a frolic condensate below 500 Kelvin. So, you can't drive, you can't make a biological Froelich condensate in the way that Froelich described it without heating the system up to a ridiculous temperature. Uh, now, other things we did, Froelich used quantum statistical mechanics. We went back to the beginning, we used classical statistical mechanics, a recurring theme for this afternoon's lectures. We read and write Froelich's equations using classical statistical mechanics. There is absolutely nothing quantum about a Froelich condensate. It's a classical effect. It does not guarantee macroscopic phase coherence, as everyone has assumed for 40 years it does. It's a classical effect. It may well show quantum coherence, but that would have to be Hamiltonian dependent, unlike Froelich's general result. So we then set apart to see, we took a a Hamiltonian, this is called the Will Huston Hamiltonian, and it produces Froelich condensates. So we took that and tried to see if there was any coherence in the motion. The Hamiltonian has just got harmonic oscillators for the system, harmonic oscillators for the low temperature bath, 
harmonic oscillators for the source, high temperature source. We use uh, Nose Ahu the thermostats for both the low temperature bath and the high temperature source to fix the temperature. Then there's a coupling between the source and the system, a uh, system bath coupling. And this cubic anharmonicity here, which redistributes the energy, this cubic term is again critical. Uh, and indeed, we, this model completely reproduces the Frohlich condensate. And uh, show you here, this is uh, some output of the Frohlich condensate. Uh, we used a source, uh, a bath temperature of 300 Kelvin, a source temperature from memory of 50,000 Kelvin. 50,000 Kelvin. And this is the lowest frequency mode, and this is the energy in that mode. It's around here at 30 to 40,000 Kelvin energy in the lowest frequency mode. Here's all the other modes way down here on a logarithmic scale with a, a hundredth or a thousandth of the energy that's in the lowest mode, exactly as Froelich described. This is your Froelich condensate. The only thing we've added is the temperature at which you get it. Yep. And you use the nervous system just dissociate when you put the <laughs> well, that, um, that's my point. These temperatures are not physical. So the mathematics is perfectly correct. Everything that Froelich said, but you can't get it using a mechanical energy source here at a reasonable physiological temperature. You cannot build experimentally. Yes, it, yeah. It's, uh, that's why no one's seen a Froelich condensate in 40 years. Now, this is energy coming from a mechanical source. If the energy comes from a radiative source, it's a different matter. And indeed, uh, you know, theories from tissue damage by microwave phones or uh, the effects of terahertz medicine, how, how that operates, is that all these things are unknown. And Froelich condensates have been impl implicated in all of these things with power coming from a radiative source. And uh, uh, there's certainly a possibility that things could happen but not when it's coming from a mechanical energy source like what's required here. Uh, oh, another thing where a frolic condensate could be critical is in a chemical reaction, in an enzyme reaction. You may be not in the limit of the condensate, but you may be in a very, very low limit of it where things are just starting to happen. You could have 20 or 30 percent more quantity in a, in a mode, in a protein, than you expect to have. Not, not a million times more like a Froelich condensate, but just imagine 20 or 30 percent. That would change enzyme kinetics dramatically. So what we've said here is that people have been looking in the wrong region for 40 years for a Froelich condensate. You need to look in these really weak things. And there may be many cases in which it can be found, I think, now. Uh, anyway, reactions to our papers. Well, Penrose gave a seminar four weeks ago completely ignoring us, saying that uh, his model was the only way to explain consciousness. Uh, Pakuni uh, has a paper out there where he says that we're all wrong and it's really easy to get frolic condensates and microtubules, but uh, his paper is all in terms of occupation numbers of vibrational quanta, and uh, his system was running at 4 million Kelvin, and that was being spontaneously produced from the energy gradients inside a cell. So uh, all the laws of thermodynamics are violated. Uh, in this objection to uh, uh, our paper. And that's typical of the Froelich literature. Uh, Hammeroff, uh, yesterday, well, he had this uh, big talk on Google where he got stuck into us, no doubt, although I haven't seen us. There are two videos on YouTube where we were denounced in no uncertain terms. Uh, 7,000 hits, I believe, those videos have had. Um, he says the original model was never meant to be taken literally. Um, and that's the two conformers in the turbulence and the electron transfer between them, so I don't know how they were supposed to be taken. Uh, but he now has Orko R2, he calls it, which only involves the London forces in the hydrophobic pockets. Uh, he says that in terms of a geometrical displacement, you only need, I can't remember if he says picometers or femtometers between the two conformers. So, so that's how he gets away from his original two-conformer model and just is able to talk on the things which, which we never mentioned. 
And the reason we never mentioned is because they made no sense whatsoever and they weren't connected to the, the real to the real quantum computer model that, that he actually had in there that could possibly have been feasible. Um, so entanglement between hydrophobic residues. We, we took here a benzene dimer. Uh, what is the entanglement in a benzene dimer? Well, if you look at the Hartree-Fock ground state, uh, that shows no entanglement whatsoever. Uh, the Hartree-Fock ground state. So then we went to an MP2 calculation. An MP2 calculation mixes in a whole lot of uh, terms. So these terms. Some of them are single excitations on molecule A interacting with a single excitation on molecule B. So that's a Forster term. That's what drives exciton transport that everyone's used to. And these are the dominant terms for the MP2 energy. You just sum all the Forster terms to get the MP2 energy. But they're also ionic terms where you transfer an electron from A to B here. Uh, so how do you calculate the entanglement? The entanglement is intrinsic. You produce a uh, a matrix alpha here, which uh, links. Uh, uh, so every term in the CI expansion appears as an element on that matrix somewhere. And how it works is this. So this Forster term, for example, has this configuration on uh, molecule A, and that's a row here in the matrix. And uh, there's, of course, a very large number of possible possibilities of molecule B here, and they all appear down here. As you change molecule B. So this one here, this is this configuration on molecule B gives you the column. So I use Gaussian here to calculate the MP2 coefficients. Every coefficient that comes out appears at one spot on this matrix, whose dimension is n to the fourth down here because that's the size of the MP2 expansion. And hence the number of basis functions. Um, then from that you get a density matrix, uh, alpha alpha transpose, which is the same as alpha transpose to alpha. Uh, and obtain the eigenvalues of that density matrix, which is of order n to the twelfth, because uh, it's the n to the four as the dimension. But uh, I produced an analytical transformation down on the end of the sixth problem, and uh, I'm solving it numerically at order n to the fifth. So if Gaussian can do the MP2 calculation, my code here can work out the entanglement. And the entanglement, this is the Lamoine entropy. It's the sum over all the eigenvalues of rho log to the base 2 of rho. So it's, it's like the Shannon entropy in a classical system. And this is what we get. For an ethylene dimer, the entanglement is 0.019. Benzene dimer, 0.034. Naphthalene dimer, 0.065. You need a value around 1 to have a quantum computer. And this is the total entanglement between all electrons on each side. In fact, it's proportional to the number of electrons sigma and pi. Uh, you need an experiment which can resolve that entanglement, and such an experiment probably looks at a single electron's entanglement. And this is the sum of the entanglement of all electrons. So whilst entanglement and correlation are intricately related, you can't have electron correlation without having entanglement. The MP2 force produced, uh, the amount of entanglement producing the van der Waals force is trivially small. Uh, and lucky last, gone, uh, oh no, wait a minute. Uh, if you squash the molecules together though, so here's benzene dimer, entanglement 1034, you can squash them together and do the Diels order 4 plus 2 cycle addition reaction here. And that has an entanglement of two and a half. And the entanglement is all tied up in the sigma bonds that's produced there. And that is, uh, in principle, measurable by an experiment. You could dream up an experiment to exploit that entanglement and make a quantum computer in, in principle. Don't ask me how in practice. Uh, but you've got to make chemical bonds to have serious entanglement. Just the van der Waals force does not give you serious entanglement. These are Caspian two calculations using uh, done using my multi reference CI code that I wrote in the eighties. Uh, right now, what coherence do you get with the London forces? Uh, so, oh, already yeah, yeah, just missing one more. Um, uh, they reckon you know the London forces is a fluctuating dipole. 
So this fluctuating dipole, they reckon, uh, has coherences of the energy of interaction between those fluctuating dipoles, which goes from one hydrophobic pocket to the next hydrophobic pocket, all the way down the microtubule. 6 megahertz is the frequency they want to have for this fluctuation. Uh, so, questions to answer. What is the magnitude of the dipoles created by the uh, van der Waals force? Uh, what is the energy of interaction between neighbouring fluctuations? And on what time scale do these fluctuations occur? So, this is all stuff you can teach in a first year chemistry course. It's the, the absolute fundamentals of a, van, of a uh, London force, but no one's ever, as far as I could tell, uh, asked these questions before. Uh, so, what I've done here is a benzene dimer. And now I'm doing, I'm doing a CISD calculation, this time instead of an MP2 calculation. I'm doing a time-dependent CISD, again, with my 1980s multi-reference CI code. Uh, and what I do, I get the CISD ground state, and uh, some of the terms are ionic terms where you move an electron, or double ionic where you move two electrons. And I'm deleting all the terms which are A plus or A2 plus. And we're retaining all the A minus and A2 minus terms. So I've created a, uh, a high energy state, it's not the ground state anymore, but it has a big dipole moment across it because I've deleted half of the charge transfer terms. And then I solve for the, uh, the time dependent Schrodinger equation for the evolution of this starting wave function. And this is what I get this is time in femtoseconds up to 25 femtoseconds. Here, very fast oscillation at about 5 per femtosecond of the dipole moment. But the magnitude of the dipole moment here is 0 0.001 divide. And that's when I've plotted all of the charge transfer terms. I get 0 0.001 divide for the dipole moment. The energy required to clobber all those terms is 3.7 volts. 150 times larger than thermal energy. Uh, Penrose and Hameroff want to have thermal fluctuations. so. Uh, the amount of the dipole moment that's being produced is extremely small. What I haven't done is the uh, dipole dipole order correlation function to get the decoherence caused by the motion of the other electrons, but it's going to be sub femtosecond. So they want the motion to be 6 megahertz, it's, uh, it's more like 6 times 10 to the 15 hertz. Uh, they want the dipole moment of hundreds of divides, it's a thousandth of a divide or a hundredth of a thousandth of a divide. Uh, it's just bizarre, everything that, that they say about it. So, the end, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Could you show us the calculation of the quantum gravity? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, come on, let's ask the more fun. There's no chill. I can score. No. Right here. Yeah. Um, well, I'll use my fingers, right? So here's the four atoms of ammonia in one configuration, and here's the four atoms of ammonia in the other configuration, and, and of course the centre of mass is conserved, so they sit like that. So I've got eight atoms. So calculate the gravitational potential energy between these four atoms and these four atoms. Like the gravitational potential energy between Earth and the Moon. Uh, and that will give you an energy. Yeah. This is the classical energy. Yes, the classical energy, the classical, classical gravitational energy. Right. Now, if there's a million ammonia pairs in coherence with each other, then you multiply that by a million. Yeah. So, so the coherence of the motion here, the, the flipping up and down of this ammonia dimer, is held coherent with the one you know, over there. So they're both flipping quantum mechanically coherent fashion. And then there's a million of those all flipping quantum mechanically coherently. I like it was a Bose-Einstein condensate. Uh, so that gives you, if there's a million of them, it gives you a million times the gravitational energy of just one. And then you divide the h bar by that energy and it gives you a time. And that's the decoherence time by quantum gravity. And that's my interpretation of their equation. Okay, so it does, none, none of this has to do with the mass change when it changes from one inversion level to the next? 
Mate, if you use my interpretation, you get their number, they get their equation. They do not say anywhere that I have found where the equation comes from. Uh -huh. So, okay, so thank you very, very much. Definition, right? Uh, so it shouldn't be quantum effects. Okay? Of course, there's no, no question that biomolecules ultimately will be governed by quantum mechanics, of course. But uh, if you, of course, uh, many phenomena actually are really described by rates, and so much of the quantum mechanics may be as sophisticated as it may be. At the end, it goes into a rate expression. Right? So this was meant to be trivial. Sorry for some of the <laughs> talks, right? uh, but the, the idea was that if you, that uh, we have quantum effects that cannot be described in terms of rate processes. Uh, I think it's even that is uh, somewhat ambitious because uh, if, if you we had a lot about these uh, light harvesting systems, of course you would say if if you just hop, then this is. Uh, Classical, but if you have them quantum coherence, this is quantum. But uh, as was correctly pointed out, if you diagonalize uh, the excitonic Hamiltonian and then you have uh, delocalized energy levels for the excitons, then you can again describe things in terms of rate, namely in terms of energy relaxation rates. And in that sense, you again have something trivial, right? Uh, so it really. Uh, uh, coherence is basis dependence, right, if you uh, de define it in terms of off diagonal elements. So it's not a really satisfactory concept, right? So, uh, uh, so the, it uh, it's, remains still, I think, uh, no question to define this, the title of the conference <laughs> in, a, <laughs> in a correct way. Yeah. Now, I don't want to be sadistic, but we. Uh, Michael has uh, <laughs> actually <laughs> put down a list uh, of questions that you that have been invited to this workshop should address here and solve, right? Yeah. There was one question, under which conditions do non-trivial quantum effects, now we don't really know what non-trivial means, exist in natural biomolecules and uh, structures, I think we have there has been some gro progress in, uh, for instance, in this photosynthetic rings. I think now it's clearer than uh, one and a half years ago that it's not a vibronic effect, that it's really an excitonic effect. And, uh, so there has been some progress, but uh, I think there are also still open things. Now, whether quantum coherence really plays a functional role of course, we have seen uh, it modifies the efficiency by a few percent, right? But this, is that really a functional effect? Uh, maybe it's still questionable whether or, what, or what do you really need quantum mechanics in order to be effective? Now, the time scale, length scales, and these things of decoherence, of course, they depend a lot on uh, the interaction with the environment. We have seen, uh, I think, uh, also quite some progress in, in theory recently uh, in dealing with these systems, but uh, I think there is still a lot of room uh, to get real theory, which uh, I think now you could do molecular dynamics for a real system, get all the spectrum from there, put it into the quantum calculations, and, uh, and then maybe make real predictions, right, that wouldn't have any parameters that you fit to experiments or things like this. It shouldn't be, I think it's really something that will come Near future. This is, of course, again uh, uh, related to the protein solvent environment effect. 
What else has Michael put down? Can we exploit these principles to design more efficient artificial structures? That's a very exciting question, right? I think we have no answer to that question, right? Uh, but of course, uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting question. And probably the solution to that question will not be just in uh, copying what nature is doing. After all, we are not flying with airplanes like this, right? So there are other solutions, perhaps. <laughs> but uh, quantum effects, maybe they are also technologically relevant for energy harvesting, but we, we don't know right now. So what can, can we learn? So I thought, reading this again this morning, it looks more like a program for a series of conferences, right? So uh, I guess we have to read, meet more regularly. There is more work to be done, and I'm sure there will be more workshops that will come in the near future. I hope you had a good time here, and we will see you all again at some other meeting in the future. Okay. <laughs>